Welcome and thank you very much for being here. My name is Neil Graboy and I'm the Dean of the uh, Milano School. And uh, we're always delighted to have uh, a crowd of people who are really focused on the issues and the issues we're going to be talking about this morning are really important. Uh, beyond test scores, imagining new ways to measure New York City's high schools is uh, a, a crucial topic, especially with all that's been going on across the country in uh, examining ways in which schools should be assessed. Uh, the Center for New York City Affairs at Milano, along with Inside Schools, organized this event as part of its larger mission to promote policy innovations that strengthen communities and improve the effectiveness of city and state government. The research project the center will present today is emblematic of the kind of work that happens year-round at the Milano School. We offer graduate degree programs in urban policy, nonprofit management, organizational change, international affairs, and environmental policy with a faculty of about two. Uh, but it's a, a rich program and uh, we're delighted to be able to uh, educate the next generation of professionals. We provide ourselves on bridging the gap between theory and practice. From their very first semester, we engage our students in hands-on policy work and experiential learning, connecting them directly to organizations and agencies working to create change both within New York City and around the world. Our students include current and future policymakers in government, as well as nonprofit leaders, labor and community activists, legislative staffers, and private sector, sector executives. I want to thank the center's funders, in particular the Donors Education Collaborative, the Cirrus Fund, and the Milano Foundation for supporting today's forum. Our goal today is to have a compelling and constructive conversation. This dialogue should have a great deal of meaning for all of us who are trying so hard to make New York City's public education system as strong as it possibly can be. Uh, I have to uh, make a kind of personal confession here. I am a product of New York City high schools, uh, in particular a neighborhood school as well as an examination school. And in my day when uh, I had to travel uh, an hour each way to get to school, uh, one uh, didn't wonder so much about the quality of schools. You were stuck in your neighborhood. The world has changed dramatically since then uh, in terms of uh, schools that appeal uh, citywide. And we are now in a situation where neighborhoods uh, are not defining characteristics of the quality of schools, which is a step in the right direction. On the other hand, we now have enormous challenges for helping the public choose schools and have a basis for determining what is a good school, uh, good on what criteria, and what are less good schools. I think that's uh, both an important change for us and a challenge as we look forward. Uh, our world is a very different one today. And uh, to get started on how different it is, it's my pleasure to introduce Andrew White, the director of the Center for New York City Affairs. Andrew. Thank you, Neil. Good morning. Another great turnout for the end of the school year. It's fantastic, or the day after the end of the school year. Um, I direct the Center for New York City Affairs, which I hope most of you know already is the, uh, we focus on applied policy research on child and family issues and um, public education in New York, as well as a few other things. And we are home to insideschools.org. Um, in 2010, the Center published a report called Managing by the Numbers, Empowerment and Accountability in New York City's High Schools. And it was the first time that anyone at least as far as we know, anyone had published a very thorough analysis of the theory and practice and hazards and successes of the Department of Education's school accountability system that emerged um, under Joel, Joel Klein's chancellorship. And as we all know now pretty well, the, each of New York City's public schools are held to account each year on a set of key metrics. Um, these metrics are evolving every year as well, and they're becoming more nuanced, but they're still heavily driven by state test scores at the elementary and middle school level and by regents scores and graduation rates at the high school level. Principals and schools are intensely focused on the metrics that the administration includes in its accountability system. 
because they have consequences attached to them. At the extreme, failure in that accountability system can mean the closure of a school. But for the most part, we also know that the general public doesn't really understand the school progress report grades that the Department of Education issues each year, ranking schools by letter from A to F, which are grades that the press eagerly latches onto and publishes with only limited explanations. So what we learned in 2010 when we did this, admittedly two years ago, so things have evolved a bit since then, but what we learned then is that most people, especially parents, didn't understand what the letter grade was telling them. They didn't understand what it meant, progress from year to year. Um, it's essentially an internal accountability tool for the DOE that ended up in the public eye, intentionally on the administration's part, but not with the kind of explanations that one would hope for. So while acknowledging that the DOE has done a lot to add to this over the last few years, the confusion we heard not just from school parents, but even from some statisticians and education policy wonks got us thinking. Um, what would it take, we thought, to create a more holistic and consumer-oriented uh, tool that provides parents with the information they want and need about the city's public high schools, with that being the motive instead of the internal management function that the progress reports were really supplying? And much of the data we needed, or we thought we needed to do this were actually available in different places, either on the web or in data sets that we've gotten with the help of the Department of Education and the New York State Education Department. The full list of sources is on the back page of the handout that we gave everybody. It's this, that is the sample school scorecard um, that we've been developing. In fact, New York is rich with data about its schools, more so than most other places in the country. It's just not always easy to find for parents. So we use the progress report, we use two different graduation data sets, we use the city's learning environment survey, we use the master schedule and course data and a whole lot more. And in trying to figure out what measures and details to highlight in this scorecard, we interviewed parents and teens and we organized focus groups beginning more than a year ago. We had discussions with teachers and principals and DOE officials and we tested a number of different approaches with a wide variety of people so what we've created, what you have in your hand, is the first iteration of a scorecard that we hope by this fall will be of great use to parents and, and to readers of the Centers Inside Schools website and probably also to eighth graders in some form or other. We have to figure out how to do that. But in a lot of cases, it's the eighth graders who are making decisions about where they're going to go to high school or where they're going to apply. So it'll be on Inside Schools in some form right next to the school reviews that we do there. The example of the scorecard that you have in your hands shows the information for the high school for law, advocacy, and community justice on Amsterdam Avenue in the Martin Luther King campus. And we're lucky to have Miriam Nightingale on our panel today. She's the former principal of that school, so she can talk about how it reflects what she knows about the school. Later this summer, we'll release scorecards for about 40 high schools so they can be compared side by side. Right now, we're waiting for feedback from other principals on those, so we don't want to put them out to the public yet, and from parents and students before we do the full release. But we're already seeing some fascinating differences across schools. So for example, if you look at this, this is the college path information. On the top is Townsend Harris in Queens. On the bottom is the one that you've got in your hand, which is the High School for Law, Advocacy, and Community Justice. You can see the difference. Of course, it's a bit unfair because Townsend Harris is a very different type of a school. It's, it's a good example to just show the differences across many schools, but um, Townsend Harris is a very selective school. What this shows though, 278 freshmen enrolled in 2006 and 278 enrolled in college in the fall four years later from Townsend Harris. On the flip side, Townsend Harris has much bigger class sizes. And then how safe does this school feel, which is, you know, in our focus groups we found was one of the top priorities of parents, if not the top priority, sort of safety and climate issues about the school or what they cared about most. And Townsend Harris, very safe. High School for Law Advocacy and Community Justice, pretty safe. Some of the other ones, 
you know, we're using safety in a broad sense, but basically using learning environment survey and other uh, feedback to get a sense of how kids feel at the school. So we want parents and students to have easy access to a large variety of information to help them identify the school that's right for them. And all of this is just the start. What we'll discuss today is why we chose certain indicators instead of others and how these data can be used to create greater understanding of the schools. And we also want to understand what a web-based web version of this might look like on Inside Schools, which, which Clara will talk about in just a minute. Following on what DOE has been doing itself, we want to determine if this tool is, or something like it can help parents recognize and encourage and reward schools where the curriculum is deep and w as well as broad and where teaching is not only oriented towards success on the Regents tests and on, and on graduation, but also focused on the successful pursuit of, children, of their children's interests and passions and their independent, hopefully satisfying work lives in the future. As we had a great discussion last week talking about some of this, you know, how do we get beyond high stakes metrics and think about the issues that truly matter in young people's lives going out into the world beyond graduation. So as always, we're very eager for your feedback. Uh, I want to thank Kim Nauer for guiding this project so diligently, and Jared Carano, who just graduated from Milano, who did an immense amount of work on this, um, and Clara Hemphill for helping out as well. Um, I want to thank our primary funder on the project, the Donors Education Collaborative, as well as our other key funders on education policy, including the Robert Sterling Clark Foundation, the United Way of New York City, the Deutsche Bank Americas Foundation, Capital One, New York Community Trusts, the Cyrus Fund, and the Milano Foundation. Um, and as I said at our forum last week, we truly thank the Department of Education for, for its assistance with the data and its feedback. And this has, in fact, in some ways been a collaboration with them. Um, we, and we couldn't really have done it without that data. So thanks. Um, I want to introduce Clara Hemphill. She's senior editor at the Center and the founding editor of InsideSchools.org. Clara. Um, in your packets, you have uh, uh, four pages of uh, PDF of the beginning of our scorecard. And what I did in this slideshow, what we did in this slideshow is further synthesize it. Um, we think that even the four pages is going to be a lot for uh, parents to digest. And I imagine that as we go forward, we will f uh, further revise this, and we would love your feedback on what's the most useful and what's not useful here, based on all of your experience. Um, but one of the things we found is that kids really care about things like whether they can go out for lunch and whether they have uh, lockers. Um, they care a lot about whether the other students are going to be strong students or weak students. So this shows uh, um, whether what the entry level is of the kids coming in, mid-level two. Um, the most important thing for most parents and kids we discovered is, is a school safe. And so we uh, took the um, Board of Ed has a really wonderful um, survey of 800,000 parents, teachers, and kids every year that asks them a whole bunch of questions. And uh, what we did is we picked out just a couple of questions that we thought were really indicative, and we'd like your uh, feedback on whether these are good ones or not. But uh, we picked the ones of whether the kids feel safe in the hallways, bathrooms, and locker rooms. Almost everybody feels safe in their classroom. I mean, we really don't have that problem in the city. And there's a lot of schools where the neighborhood is kind of dicey and um, the kids don't feel safe outside. But we thought this was a pretty good example of um, how kids, uh, the, the climate of the school. Um, and we also thought that a good indicator is whether the teachers say order and discipline is maintained. Um, one of the things we want to know are the kids happy and do the teachers inspire them. And uh, this, this um, 
at this school, which um, uh, is one of the schools in the Martin Luther King building, 76% of the kids say their teachers inspired them to learn, which I, I think is pretty good. Um, we also, um, what about the teachers? Are the teachers happy? And we thought that this indicator about whether the teachers trust their principal um, is, is a good one. Um, the class, there was some debate with the people when we talked to the Department of Ed about class size. People say, oh, well, class size doesn't really matter. And um, for this slide, I picked the English class size because um, I think that for the typical uh, Board of Ed teacher who has five sections of 34 kids in English, that really limits the number of, uh, the amount of writing that they can have um, kids do because if you do the math, it's 170 papers to grade. So that teachers who have the standard uh, Department of Ed class size of 34 really don't assign that much writing. Um, and so that we think the English cl the class size is uh, significant here. Um, another number, the 71% of students attend school at least nine out of 10 days. This is the flip side of the chronic absenteeism number. Um, we've, uh, a lot of research shows that if kids miss more than a month of school a year, that is if they miss 20 days or so, uh, they're really not going to be on track for graduation. That, that's a really good indicator. So we, at this school, 71% of the students were on track in terms of their attendance. Um, uh, the other big thing that parents care about is how likely is my child to graduate? At this school, I think, especially considering the um, uh, level of the kids coming in, they did a really excellent job of uh, having them graduate on time. Um, we also showed the number of kids who earn the advanced regents diploma and the number of kids who drop out. Those numbers don't add up because there are other kids who are going to stay for a fifth year. Um, one of the things that, of course, you don't care whether other kids are graduating so much as you care whether your child is graduating. And one of the numbers that I really love in here is the percentage of special education students who are graduating in four years. And in this, you can see, that's the second bar there, that 62% of the special needs students graduated in four years, graduated on time. Um, and that's double the citywide average. So this is a number that not all the parents are going to care about. But if your child has special needs, you're going to care about that number a lot. So that's uh, uh, one of the um, indicators that we added. Um, this is really the, um, I think this is what we've added that's really important. And I also think it's, I've got to give credit to the Department of Ed for coming up with these um, uh, numbers. One of the things that I discovered in visiting schools, I went to um, uh, the High School of Sports Careers in the Bronx. And they got an A on their school report card, but they only offer three years of math and three years of science. And their theme, which is sports careers, they only have one class in the theme. So the kids go to that school thinking they're going to have a lot of sports, and what they really have is a lot of remedial reading and math, which is probably what they need. Um, and the prince, I said to the principal, but you're not offering a college prep curriculum. Even if the kids want to go to college, they're not having enough classes. And he said, well, the Department of Ed you know, grades me on how many kids pass Regents exams. And that's my job. So all I, have to, all I can do and all I'm equipped to do is to get as many kids as possible to pass five Regents exams. Um, so that one of the things that the department has looked in recently and that we think is very important is to figure out does the school offer a college prep curriculum? Not every child is going to go to college, but before you sign up for a school, you want to know whether at least they offer the college prep curriculum. Um, the top number is um, the number of students who pass at least one college prep class, which would be either an advanced placement class or an IB class or one of the higher level math and, English, uh, math and uh, science classes. Um, uh, we also say, and this is compared, 39% doesn't sound very high, but when you compare it to the citywide average, that's actually very good, or better than average. Um, we were astonished at the number of schools that don't offer chemist, don't even offer chemistry and physics, and don't even offer algebra two. So we're putting that on, on this as well. 
Um, those are numbers that we got uh, that are not publicly available on the Department of Ed website, but we got from the Department of Ed. Um, are the students, so question, do they offer a college prep curriculum? And are they ready for college? And these are numbers that, um, uh, how many kids are taking the SATs? And how do their uh, scores compare to the citywide average? And then this, these two numbers, the 22% and the 52% are numbers that the department has started publishing recently, um, but not including yet in the grade. Is that right, Martin? It's gonna be in the fall they'll start using it, yeah. Um, the number of kids who started in 2007, graduated four years later with test scores on their regents that were high enough to avoid remediation at CUNY. Huge numbers of kids um, uh, graduate and then go to CUNY and have to take remediation. So we want to give you an idea. Um, uh, I, I do want to point out that in, in Miriam's defense, who's sitting in the front row and who ran this school for five years, the kids were coming in with very, very low levels of skills. And to get them to graduate on time took heroic measures, especially when you look at the number of special needs kids and English language learners who are coming in there. So the fact that she wasn't able to get them from a sixth grade level to a 12th grade level and a college level in four years is no reflection on how, you know, uh, it's no, it's no I, I don't mean to say that that was a bad number, but if it's your child, you might want to know that the, the child is likely to need remediation at CUNY. Um, this is a, a very interesting number, too, which the department has um, uh, found, I think, somewhat miraculously, is that they've been able, using Social Security uh, numbers and student IDs, they've been able to track whether kids actually show up at college, um, which I think is fabulous. In the past, the um, school report cards just had a survey of students' intent. And the fall of their uh, senior year, or the spring of their junior year, they'd ask them, do you plan to go to college? And 95% of the kids would say yes. Um, furthermore, you ask principals how many of your kids go to college, and they will tell you in the spring of senior year how many kids were admitted to college. But there's this tremendous melt over the, over the summer. What the department was able to do was find the number of students who actually enrolled in college. And this is, of the kids who entered high school, graduated four years later, how many of those were actually enrolled in college? What you find, of course, is that there's this huge disconnect between how well prepared they are for college and how many actually go to college. So that the kids are trying, you know, they want to go to college, but you can see for uh, CUNY what a big problem that, for the City University of New York, what a big problem this presents is because you're getting lots of kids who are not prepared for college who are showing up. Um, um, this is, um, I was telling you about the high school of sports careers where they only have one class in sports. Um, what you'll find here is what the, whether the theme actually plays out what, and, and what kind of extracurricular activities and what kind of sports there are. So at that point, I'm going to call up the panel. Um, panel, come up. <laughs> um, um, and I don't have the bio sheets, so I'm going to wing this. Um, thank you. I have the bio sheets. <laughs> um, uh, on, uh, on the far right, we have uh, Jackie Wayans, who uh, was the co-author of New York City's Best Public High Schools and New York City's Best Public Middle Schools. She's an um, administrative coordinator at the center and an assignment editor for both Inside Schools and for the Center of New York City Affairs. She's a uh, proud mother of uh, three public school children, uh, one of whom, two of whom are now graduated, and one of whom, um, and it's a testament to the improvements that have happened in the New York City public school system that uh, years ago when we first met, she wouldn't be caught dead sending her kids to school in the Bronx. And now she does have one child who's at school in the Bronx. So uh, she always brought her kids into Manhattan um, until that. Then we have uh, Teresa Fernandez, who is the chief operating oper uh, officer at the After School Corporation. Uh, we have, um, she worked at the Department of Education 
and the director of funded programs. She ran a dropout prevention program for students in Washington Heights and led a summer bridge program and taught English at the Riverdale Country School. Um, Miriam Nightingale, we don't have a bio for her, but she actually has a bio. She, uh, <laughs> she's been teaching in the New York City public school system since uh, 1993 when she taught at uh, Boys and Girls High School in Brooklyn, after which she went to uh, Brooklyn Tech, so she's had very different experiences there. She was the principal at the school in Martin Luther King Building that we just showed you the slideshow about um, for, uh, what, five, six years? Seven. Seven years. And she's now a uh, principal at Columbia Secondary School um, on the Upper West Side. Um, Martin Kurzweil is uh, the num chief numbers cruncher at the uh, Department of uh, Education, uh, director of the Office of Research, Accountability, and Data. Um, um, he oversees the school accountability system, including the progress reports. And uh, Bob Hughes, um, I, I first met many years ago when he was a lawyer at uh, Advocates for Children. Um, he's now the head of New Visions for Public Schools, which is um, an organization which started a lot of the small schools and has really been in the forefront of the uh, school reform movement in New York City. So I'm going to start by asking uh, Jackie, who was, the, um, among other things, was one of the people who did our focus groups to find out which of the measures we should use on this uh, inside stats. Jackie, tell me from your um, talking to uh, your focus groups, what do parents care about and what do kids care about? Okay, so as we mentioned, safety was a key module for um, parents. It was very interesting to me to find out that um, parents and students look at safety in a very, very different way. You know, parents are looking at whether there are metal detectors in the school, how much suspensions are happening, and how is that managed, where children are really more intuitive. They want to know what it's like in the classroom, in their space. Do they feel safe, or is the principal locked in their the, the office? Uh, can they connect with teachers, is their classroom management. So there was a very different um, classification of what parents meant by safety and what students meant by safety. And um, tell me about what you, your daughter just graduated from the High School of Fashion Industries. Yes. What do you know now that you wish you'd known when she was in eighth grade looking for schools? You know, it's very interesting. Um, I have two girls and they both went to um, art high schools. Uh, art and design and fashion industries. And I think we chose the best we can. They were both A, a schools at the time in terms of the report card and what we were looking at. And they were our top choices also on our application process. But what I didn't realize is that uh, my middle daughter, her school when she started did not have a four year math sequence, right? So in her junior year, they just started it. So that means that um, they had to figure out how they were gonna get students on the track. And she missed that track because she got a 72 instead of 75 on her, her region's math. And we didn't understand the consequences of that, right? We thought, oh, she could just you know, take her region's again next year. We didn't realize it would keep her out of a track to be qualified for college readiness you know, in terms of when she gets to, to uh, college. So she'll need to take remediation Definitely. At, at CUNY. Yes. And and the, the math and science at uh, High School of Fashion Industries wasn't, it wasn't on your mind when you were looking. I actually just assumed that there was a four year sequence. You know, my older daughter had it at her high school and I just thought it was there. And so, you know, this information, um, you know, it is available on the report card, but it's not at a glance. And that's another thing that the parents said that was really important to them. They want to see information that's easy to find, that they can get to in, in quick hits. They want the important stuff right at the top. And kids even said they want to see more like bulleted information. If they want to go deeper, they will, but they just want little short snapshots of what's really important to them. And, and your daughter also didn't know the 
Well, she was perfectly happy not taking math, right? Yeah, I, <laughs> she was very happy not taking You know, for the first uh, semester of her junior year, I'm thinking to myself, why don't you have any math? This doesn't make any sense. So by the time I got into the guidance counselor, who was wonderful, by the way, but whenever you're talking about a school that has over 1,000 students, it's going to be hard to manage everyone and, and know who's getting what. So it was actually a surprise to him when we sat down and we went through everything and he explained what happened. Yeah. Too late to fix at that point, though. <laughs> Um, Miriam, tell me what, um, what do parents look for when they're looking for a school and what should they look for when they're looking for a school? Well, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, it works. Um, good morning. Um, what do parents look for? So I, I hear I can relay um, some parent conversations that, I, that I've had with parents. Um, many times I have conversations with parents um, who are looking they're looking for lockers, they're looking for after school programs, they're looking for arts programs. A lot, of, uh, a lot of questions come up about that. I don't get that many questions. Uh, I get questions about foreign language programs. Um, I don't get that many questions about math classes. I do get some questions about what books are you reading in English class, which I think is a really great question. Um, and I wish I sort of wish I got more questions like that. I don't frequently get those kinds of questions. And I also get questions about who are the kids in your school in different ways. A lot of the questions are around who are the kids in your school? Um, and are they the kinds of kids that I would feel comfortable that my child is um, interacting with? So I get a lot of questions around that um, question. What neighborhoods do they come from? Never really that exact question, but a lot of parent inquiries are around the question of who's in your school. and. Um, actually, not that many questions about teachers either. But I, I, you're, you also asked me who, what should they ask? So I like the question about what books are you reading? What books, have, what, what books do you read in your English sequence? That's a great question. Um, what are your advanced math classes? I think that's a great question. Um, uh, some, I think you told me that, that they don't really care about the curriculum, that they care about. Yeah, I, I wasn't going to go there, Claire, but I see, I see you're yeah. pushing me in that direction. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't get that many questions about curriculum. And as um, Jackie was sort of saying, I think there are a lot of assumptions that parents make. I don't think they realize how different from school to school curriculum is. I don't think that they realize how, how much curriculum is sort of in the hands of individual teachers in individual principles. And it's not standardized. I want to say that again. It's not standardized. You cannot assume that what one school does, the, the experience that your middle school child had, is going to be the same uh, experience that a middle school child had, even in the same A school, even in the same neighborhood, even across the street. There's a huge difference um, did, did from people, class to class and school to school. Did people come to your school thinking they were going to be lawyers when they left? Some, there were some, there's some idea about that. There's also sort of an idea that if I put my child in a school called law, you know, four years later, I'm going to have a lawyer. And, you know, so when I got to the school, they were reading, like, case law, and they had these courses in Fordham in, in ninth grade, and they were all failing them. The, the highest, the, the courses that were at the theme were the highest failure courses in the school. So there's sort of the magical thinking that happens, I think, when you put these themed names on. And it's, just, it's about how do you create the path? What, do you, what path do you create? So they do, I think parents do sort of think, oh, you know, my kid's going to be a lawyer. I did have some of that. Some parents were like, um, how, you know, <laughs> where's the law degree? <laughs> I'm like, it's a little more complicated than that. Because uh, even in college, law, law studies happen in graduate school. It doesn't happen in undergraduate school. So it's a little, it's a little crazy, I think. But, um, but I think that there should, the, the, the idea of the theme should be, what is the interest? What is the engagement? And how do you create that in the classrooms? How do you attach that to classrooms and not just to after school and, and extracurricular activities? And if parents ask more questions around engagement in the classroom, I think that they would not be so surprised when, you know, about what happens in the school. Well, I, I'm also curious about say, how parents perceive safety. Um, the Martin Luther King building had a, a terrible reputation for many years. Um, I think you know, with your, your small school and the other small schools there, it's turning around, but parents are still somewhat skittish. Are they, what are they worried about? So I'll tell you a story. I wasn't going to tell the story, but I'm going to tell the story. Um, Larry told me not to tell the story, but I'm going to tell the story. Um, so 
about, so it took us a long time to develop our school and to get over sort of the reputation of Martin Luther King, you know, that great comedy routine, all schools called Martin Luther King, you know what they're like. Um, so it took us a lot of time, and we spent a lot of time sort of getting rid of that idea that any school called Martin Luther King must not be safe. Um, and so we did a lot of talking to parents about, look at the great advanced math we have. We have chemistry, we have physics, we have, you know, what can, we, we, ha we have the same kinds of things that you could find in other schools, but we have a more personalized uh, atmosphere. I guarantee you that our college counselor will walk every single child through the college process. They're going to take, we have them, they, they actually take them down to the CUNY process and walk them through the registration line, which is crazy. That registration line's insane. But, so I had a parent who was really into, he, he visited the classrooms, he was really into the, what we were doing in the school, um, and then he came to me in deciding whether to place his child in our school, and he came to me and he sat down, he said this to me, he said, I came up in the morning with my child out of the subway. And we were across the street from LaGuardia High School, right? So he said, I, I, I sat on the block where the LaGuardia students were walking down to go to their school, and then I walked over to the block where your school, where the students from Martin Luther King were walking down to go to, to the Martin Luther King campus. And he said, you know what? I just like the LaGuardia side better. And I think that that, in terms of safety, in terms of tone, I think that that is something that parents are really attuned to. He said, I just like that side better. And um, so if it, to your question of you know, how attuned are parents to this idea of safety and um, school tone and who they're going to school with, I think it's very important. And sometimes all those other considerations are completely secondary to who is my child sitting in school with and does it feel safe to me? So. You, you also told me on the phone that um, the, the fact that there were pregnant girls at the yeah. Martin Luther You are trying to get me to spill all the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm a reporter, Mary. You know. <laughs> um, that's also true. I also had um, parents. I, I, you know, I, I, I have a, I have an open admission school, and and our children have all kinds of situations in their lives, and we do. There are many um, teenage girls, sometimes as young as fourteen or fifteen, who get pregnant. Um, those children can also. It doesn't affect their brain. They can also sit in class and also uh, aspire to a college degree. Um, but I did have um, parents who came to me uh, in the office and said. I can't believe that there are pregnant children walking around your school. You know, I, my child can't go to school in a school where there are pregnant girls because um, I can't see that model. Uh, I can't let my child see that that model. It's not one that I believe in, and I don't think that that should happen. And and therefore, um, I, I it it I I think I should be able to take my child out of the school because there are pregnant girls in your school. And that that reflected on the safety of the building in some way. Yeah, for them it reflected yeah. on the safe, not, and again, safety has such a broad connotation for parents. It's safety of values, safety of, you know, it, safety of not, and, and we started uh, the school wearing uniforms. Uniforms used to be, okay, if I put my child in the school with uniforms, everything's going to be okay. But that's not so, parents have sort of walked away from that now. They're like, okay. Maybe that's not so true anymore. If they're really looking for, um, in terms of safety, I think they also mean, are your values like mine? You know, if I put, if I'm away from my child for six hours, is my child going to be getting really, really different messages than the ones that I send at home? And I think that those things are also very important. Are the teachers going to be sending different messages? Are the kids going to be sending different messages? Is the administration going to be sending different messages? And that messaging. I think parents, I don't know how to put that in a progress report, but I think that parents are very tuned to that, students are very tuned to that, and um, it because school becomes such a huge factor in the development of the child, I think that that becomes very important for parents. Uh, Teresa, um, I, one of the things we included on this is, you know, sports and activities. Um, I think it's kind of a mistake for kids to pick schools based on sports. Um, I, I met a boy who said the most important thing for him was to go to a school with a football team. He lived in East Harlem and he picked uh, John F. Kennedy in the Bronx, which is three buses and two trains or some, some enormous commute, um, and uh, didn't last there very long and ended up dropping out. Should kids care about after-curricular activities and sports? Is that, um, is that something we should even put on our school, uh, inside school stats? Well, I think, I think whether you, I think they will care about them whether you 
do or not, so I don't necessarily <laughs> think <laughs> it's, it's a matter of whether they should care about them. They do care about them. Um, and I don't think it should be the, the only consideration, certainly, just as you shouldn't, you know, we don't want our kids to choose their schools based on just where their friends are going. But um, there is a lot of evidence, um, and it, it doesn't go against, you know, like if, if nobody is graduating from the school, um, that's a, a more... That was one of the problems with right. John F. Kennedy, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, but there is evidence that kids who go, who participate in activities, in school-sponsored activities um, on an ongoing basis for two years actually are more likely to graduate, more likely to attend college, and actually more likely to complete college. Um, and so I do think it's something that kids should care about because particularly if you're going to a school that um, doesn't have a strong, a high graduation rate, there's got to be something there that hooks kids, that keeps them coming back. And it ideally, I mean, Miriam and I were having this conversation before, ideally that's something that's going on during the school day. Um, and I um, don't think that sports or arts or other, what are now considered extracurricular activities should be relegated to the hours after three. Ideally, what we want is for those things to be integrated into the school day, to be part of the consistent message and values that are being promoted by the school, and for even the academic instruction to be engaging and relevant in the way that a lot of after school activities are that hook kids to keep coming back. I, I heard somebody call it um, islands of competence. You know, if you're bad in math and you can't read very well, but you're a really good dancer, right. you'll come to school if there's a dance class. And, and maybe you'll pick up a little math and reading too. Not just come to school, but I think that, you know, realizing that you're good at dance and that if you actually persist in something you can do well, then you can apply that same, you know, then when you've been struggling in English class, say, oh, well, maybe if I apply myself in the same way that I've applied myself in dance, I can have success there as well. Yeah. Um, Martin, and I want to shift gears a little bit uh, back to the numbers. Um, you've um, produced huge quantities of data. I, I, I think somebody said that the Learning Environment Survey is the largest survey in the United States after the US Census, is that right? That, that's what we always say. I mean, I don't know how we, we would verify it, but yeah. Um, and there's uh, um, the, the data on credit accumulation and uh, regent scores and slicing and dicing all the different ways kids can graduate or not graduate or stay on time. Um, what have you, you've been at the department how long now? Uh, about two and a half years. Two and a half years. How have your views evolved since you've been there? What were you like before and what do you like now? <laughs> um, <clears throat> that's a good question. Um, I, I, I came in, uh, I think, very focused on um, quantitative measures of school quality, um, just as a result of my background and orientation. Um, and I think I uh, have, have really grown to appreciate the value of other non-quantitative um, measures of school quality, um, things like uh, the, the evaluations of schools done by experienced educators in the quality reviews, um, information that we get from people within the school or people working with the school about aspects of the culture and programming and um, harder to quantify um, elements of the academic program, uh, I've, I've found those to be really, really valuable. And I think when I first came in, I, I didn't really, uh, uh, I, I wasn't focused on that. And, and you thought it was going to be simple, right? Um, I, I don't know if, if simple is the right word. I, I thought it was, I thought the, the problem of school evaluation was um, a problem with a solution um, and, and <laughs> one that you could uh, reached by logic or math or so, you know some um, some some sort of schema, and it is certainly much more complicated than that. And that I, I very quickly realized uh, realized how complicated it is. Um, there are a lot of moving pieces. Everything you measure has um, some consequence, uh, 
and it's uh, it's it's really difficult to take that all into account um, while while still offering up an evaluation that's sensible and meaningful to the people you're uh, you're evaluating and the people you're trying to share the evaluations with. Um, Bob, are the are the current incentives in the the, the current system of um, accountability has strong incentives um, for schools to act in one way or another. The way I described the uh, principal at the um, high school of careers in sports in the Bronx. Um, it, are those incentives moving us in the right direction? Or what, are, what would you, how would you identify the problems with the current system of accountability? Well, going back to what Martin said, I, I laugh because when I was hear? a- when I was a school finance attorney, the joke was that school finance cases are big, brawling, they're like Tolstoy novels. Big, brawling, lots of actors, and everybody's dead in the end. And I do, I do feel that the school accountability question is similar. Are the incentives right? No. I, I think we're all struggling with the reality that we teach kids and they learn or don't learn. And the question becomes, how do you measure their learning in ways that support and encourage teachers to engage in more of the activities that will result in greater learning? we have a set of tests and assessments that very narrowly look at the question of whether kids are learning or not. And in some ways don't even look at the subtasks that kids are applying to problems to understand their, their full competency so that a teacher then has the knowledge and the ability to act uh, on what they're seeing in front of them. So yeah, we have a Regents exam system that is clearly not working and we're trying to move to a park assessment. We are having I'm you know, sorry, what assessment? park assessments are the assessments related to the Common Core that New York State is going to be adopting in the next couple of years that one hopes will push us to a deeper understanding of the skills that kids have and, and are trying to master. But I think the hard question is there are high consequence measures because what happens in schools every day is high stakes and getting the alignment between the measures and the, the, the consequential decisions that teachers have to make every day is a tough one. Uh, the principal of Central Park East High School told me about kids who were getting 90s on their regents, ELA regents, but getting like 350s on their SAT um, uh, uh, reading. Well, part of the, the Tolstoy novel that we have to struggle with is there's a, there's a reality of what kids know and are able to do, and then there's what we as a society want to know and able to act. So the regents in some ways are a, an assessment that the state has established, but as, as I think we talked about in our telephone call, uh, the cut scores in that exam, the, the scores that indicate whether a student is passing or not, are frequently politically determined by the, econ the political economy and what people believe uh, the public can take uh, in terms of whether kids are failing or succeeding. The Regents exams are not college ready exams. There's just no question that they don't correspond in the same way that we would like them to. But by the same token, we've done some analysis at New Visions. If kids score 80 or above uh, on the Regents exams, they seem to do much better in college than if they score below that. So there's, there's a correspondence, but there certainly isn't the type of alignment you'd like to see. Um. I want to ask everybody um, for your, if you, you just saw our um, first draft of our inside stats, um, do these metrics help move us in the right direction? If I'm fishing for compliments, that's, uh, <laughs> um, but listen, I, Martin, I, I, you know, spent a lot of time trashing the DOE's efforts. Um, <laughs> this is your chance to trash mine. Um, <laughs> well, I'm not going to trash it because Thank I actually you. do, I, I like the inside stats um, document. And um, I think the, the things that it does really well are take uh, data that, that are available, they're things that we produce, and um, convey the results in a clear and accessible way in a narrative form. Um, which for, for many people is, is easier to understand than uh, tables or charts or or, um, or what have you. Um, so I think it's it's very clear. Um, I really like the way the um, report uses the survey information. Um, the survey, like you mentioned, I think is a incredibly valuable resource with just it's just packed with information about schools and um, teasing out some of the more important questions. I think is is great. Um, 
There are a few things I think the report could do better. Um, so one, uh, one thing I think is providing more context um, for the results that are in the report. Um, you know, a 9% dropout rate, is that a good dropout rate or yeah. a bad dropout rate? Um, uh, for, Somebody I taking mean, notes on this for me? Yeah. I, I <laughs> um, I'll follow up with Kim afterwards. Okay. Um, the, uh, yeah, so, so providing a little bit more context, it's, it's, it's hard to understand a number um, without some comparator. And um, really the only comparisons we have are either other schools um, or some set of expectations for, for how kids at the particular school will do. Um, a second thing that I think um, the report uh, would benefit from is more differentiation across the different measures. So it, there's a lot of information in there, which is great, but it's, um, it's undifferentiated. It's, uh, it, it's a lot of numbers, and there's no um, clear indication of which are more important than others. The font size differs a little bit, but there are a lot of things that are at the same font size. And so just uh, having some sort of I guess some sort of summary or uh, some sort of um, uh, additional um, perspective on which of the results that are presented in the report are most important and should be focused on would help readers take away um, some main points rather than potentially kind of randomly latching on to particular numbers at the expense of others that may be much more important. So more time spent ranking these indicators in order of importance, or? Uh, I, th I think just differentiating them in, in some way. It doesn't ha necessarily have to be a ranking, but, um, but you know, calling out the, the maybe the top, the top line numbers as, the, you know, these are the things you should be focusing on the most, and then here's the details for why we think those are important um, would, would be good. But so, some sort of uh, summarizing um, perspective, I think, would be, would be helpful to the readers, again, so that there's a, a takeaway rather than leaving it up to the reader to, to, to pull what they, they will from it. Jackie. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because with the, the focus groups, uh, we found, as Andrew mentioned, that most parents and students just look at the letter grade that's on the front of the report card, A, B, C. And they make quick assumptions based on that, and they tend not to, even though the information's there, they don't tend to go at the, and look at the subsets and read the fine print and see what's going on. So this model actually has um, been guiding us in the right direction because we have to remember that most of the most of the times it's students that are going through this process themselves. Um, I found the majority, in the majority of cases, it's not the parents and the students, it is the students. And the group that I didn't talk about are the seventh and eighth graders that I did focus groups with because the eighth grade brain is completely different than the high schoolers that are being reflective, right? And I call them the captive lunch versus the Ferris wheel crowd because I actually had a, a, a young person say to me, you know, my ideal school would have a Ferris will in the cafeteria, right? <laughs> but the, that same kid was able to really clearly define for me what he would like from his teachers and what, what, he, what he would like from a principal and, and from curriculum and after school. So you're dealing with that very fragile space. So if you can really look at something and say, you know, what do other kids like about this school? Is it safe or is, or is it not? That was a seventh grader. And the process does start with the seventh grader. I mean, they're being analyzed at seventh grade, you know, so that's really the brain that we're, we're dealing with here. And so it's really great for them to have almost a Twitter, Facebook looking type of vehicle where they can get quick information and then go deeper. Bob. I mean, I think I, I agree with both comments. I would add that I think the, the challenge of any of these documents is to understand the audience and what their values are in using them. So I would add some sort of interactive fat feature that said, if you really want your son or daughter to go to a four-year private college, this is what you should be looking at. If you're interested in you know, pursuing, somehow linking the parent and the student and their aspirations to the numbers, so that it's, because these numbers don't mean anything without the context that Martin mentioned and without an understanding of how they fit into the expectations, aspirations, and interests of the particular student or her or and his family. So I think somehow making this a place where the student's concerns are privileged 
uh, and then accurately reflected in kind of context of what we know about schools would be helpful. Um, Sharissa. Yes, I was just going to add, I think, you know, what Martin was saying about that context is really critical. And um, on the preparation for college and career, you do actually start with this statement that uh, about what colleges and employers are looking for. Looking for. And so I think um, putting some context around sports, not that um, I think at the, at the panel last week, somebody said 7% of New York City high school students plan to be professional athletes. So, you know, if, if the kids are choosing um, a school because they think this is their path to their career, they're, you know, they have a football team and I'm going to be in the NFL, then that's really problematic. Um, but I do think that um, there are lots of other things that we know that employers and colleges are looking for in students, like the ability to work in teams. And I think this gets to what Miriam was talking about before, of how do we um, give more information about the coursework and the, the learning opportunities. So are there internship opportunities, real opportunities for students to gain work experience and develop skills and, and work in teams, not just what are they reading, but how are they learning? that I think um, I realize is hard to present in a snapshot. Um, I think the other thing that I, I would want to know as a parent is if my child s stumbles, which is sort of inevitable, <laughs> what kind of supports are available for them? Um, is there, does the school have advisory? And um, I think really critically, what kind of support for what college guidance is available when you're talking about college and careers? Is that support available in the school? Does the guide, is there a guidance counselor that has 500 students? Um, I think those are really important questions. Miriam, it was your school we put under the microscope. Do you want to? Uh... Um, so a question that's in my mind that I'm, I'm not sure how to answer with these documents is the sort of the top 10 Ivy League college question. Only uh, if you look at the information uh, and if you, if you run the numbers down, if you do things by, by percentages, just by the law of statistics, there's just a limited number of schools that's going to end up in that top 10%. And in New York City... Probably 10%, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably 10%, right? Uh -huh. So how do you create the report that doesn't have everybody wanting to go to the same 10 schools? Because the statistics on the report are always being compared against a citywide average, which is skewed by which is in fact the, the, the front runners are setting that curve. So it's a, I think that there's a, there are interesting things in this report that get, that, that sort of do show the under, um, the underlying, uh, that can tell a different story. But in fact, the story of the, of my school and the story of the report is always measured against the story of the top schools in the city. And there's just not enough seats in the top schools in the city for everybody to go there. And if they did, they would very, be to very different schools. So I guess that's my question, because I think that um, there are, the US News, that you know, the uh, ranking reports um, often tend to, they, they, they actually, they, they take on their own life. I was in the Peace Corps and we used to have, you know, there was a, if there was a need, like you needed a well in the village, you would call in um, an, uh, an aid organization. But after the need went away, frequently the aid organization would start to just take on its own life. It would have to create projects for itself to live. I think that's true of accountability too. You know, once you have the system in place, it's, it's created for a really good reason, but once it's there, then regardless of the validity of the tests or the, the validity of the, the information, the accountability system still has to get its numbers. And teachers still have to be evaluated. Schools still have to be evaluated. So, you know, how do you how do you fight that? Is, is yeah, I, I think that's really important, and that's something that we've tried to do in the in, in inside schools mm -hmm. is visit schools. And one of the things that I've tried to do at inside schools is identify what I call value stocks. That is, schools that have really strong leadership that haven't been discovered yet, um, and that that I don't know how you can identify that in the numbers. Maybe you can. Maybe you can't. But um, what I've always tried to do is identify schools that are on their way up, but the numbers don't show it yet, um, because I see strong leadership in place. And um, the other thing that we try to do is we have now on the Inside Schools website, we have slideshows so that you can see what a school looks like. Um, and we can describe in words what the vision of the school is. 
So, but I agree with you, that's a very, and even within the schools, um, even within the top schools, my son went to the High School of American Studies in the Bronx, which is a, an exam school, and the principal there said that because he was compared to other exam schools, the fact that his attendance was 96% instead of 97% was held against him because he looked bad within that cohort. Right, I, I think it's an ongoing problem. I was, I was listening to the, uh, the story about a 72 instead of a 75 keeping a student out of a four-year sequence and, you know, in a school. And I don't think that those stories really come out either. Because even within schools, there's great differentiation. Often the, the data in the school tells a story um, either about the worst school, kids in the school or the best kids in the school. But it doesn't tell like what happens to the average kid. When I was teaching at Brooklyn Tech, it was the kids who were getting the 80s and the 85 averages who were the least, they were the most bitter when they left the school because they had the least attention. The sort of that middle of the road kid. So it's an interesting, how does the average kid fare in a school? Can I just add one thing, which is part of the challenge in all of this work is that we're giving static numbers to a dynamic process and we're not necessarily capturing the process. So one thing that I'd be interested in as a parent, and I don't know how you do it, is if my student fails, how is the school going to respond to that failure? So for example, in Regents exams, we see you know, kids pass the Regents or they don't in their first uh, attempt. What happens to those students who don't pass? And what's the passage rate for students on the second, the third, or the fourth time? Because that gives me a sense of how the schools intervene. Similarly, if my student, your point, passes at an 85%, what's the option for that student after passing that test? How am I going to keep that student engaged and, and moving forward um, with a set of expectations that, that legitimately tie to the ability? Um, so it's a, I think there's that piece that's really important. The other question I would have for you is, how do you think about grades and why did you include them or not include them? Because student grades increasingly are seen in some of the research that I've read as a very valuable predictor of college success. And yet we very rarely have public conversations about, ab about the grades that kids are achieving in school and, and what that means. Maybe Martin would want to address that. Um, we, we use the data that we have. Yeah, so, um, the, so the progress report for high schools and now middle schools actually does include information about the students' learning in order to be really ready for their college or, or career experience after high school. Um, so, so that the data, some of that data is available and it is um, included in the accountability system already. Um, I think it is really predictive and, um, and I think it's predictive because it reflects a, uh, a, a broader set of information over a longer period of time about the student's learning. Um, it reflects the, the teacher's perspective on how the student has grown during the course of the year in a lot of different ways, not just um, how they've performed on a particular test on a particular day, um, or how they've, uh, how they've grown from one test in one year to another. Um, that information is still valuable, I think. The, the, the test-based information is still valuable, but, um, but it doesn't tell you everything. And uh, our challenge is to expand beyond, um, beyond that measure. Um, and we've made some progress, but I don't think we're, I don't think we're done yet. We still have more to do. Well, one of our goals is to give parents information, but our other goal is to um, encourage the system to move in the right direction and to change what I think we all agree are oversimplistic um, incentives, incentives that are moving us in the wrong direction and moving them in the right direction. And I want to ask the panel, is there, is there any, how can we use these um, inside stats or something similar to move the system in the right direction? I'll tell you, I, I think you have to be careful not to do too many things with a single tool or instrument. Okay. Uh, uh, and, and then, you know, schools are complicated systems and organizations. Tony Bright's work at the University of Chicago says that there are five key systems that will guarantee school success over time. If schools are successful in any three of them, it matters. Leadership, professional capacity and building that in the staff, ambitious, rigorous instruction, uh, youth development, and youth-centered learning environments that include safety and the opportunities you were describing, and parent and community outreach. And that's one of the most um, long-standing data sets we have that ties those factors to increases in student achievement over time. So I would say that when your, your audience is school-facing, you'd want to be looking at this, those systems and trying to build the capacity of those systems. 
when the audience is parent and student facing, you want to ensure that kids understand the consequence of their choice. I, I think those are very different animals. Anyone else? I, I was just going to say, in terms of the consequences of their choice, that's so important because you, you, you know you mentioned uh, the after school component and whether students should choose because of that. But even in terms of the theme, the names of schools sometimes is the sole drive for why students are choosing. And I met a young lady in the Bronx who uh, applied to health opportunities and was accepted. And she wants to be a doctor. And when she got there, she found out they only had one health course or offered. So those are the type of things where you want to make sure, you know, in the directory, it really is based year to year on whether they have the funding and they can continue that. So you need something that is up to date and alive that will really help kids to make the right choice if that's something that's key and important to them, if we know that's why they're making decisions. Oh, just in terms of sort of um, how of guiding the system, we and I think many other organizations um, fought for years to try to get after school activities including included on the learning environment survey. And the response that we always got was we can't really judge schools uh, according to that because not all schools can have the resources to offer after school activities or these extracurricular. Um, and I, I just think that including it would really push schools to, to think about those things more and think about, you know, I almost feel like schools should just have numbers instead of names because of the, you know, how those school names can be misleading. Um, and um, I think if, if principals knew that they were, that this was something that people were looking at, they would think more about trying to form partnerships with organizations that could bring some of these things into their schools. Martin, do you want to respond to that about whether to include extracurricular activities on the, I don't want to call them extracurricular. I know. It's, it's, it's um, enrichment. Or, or, what are you saying, music, art, um, I mean, some phys of it, ed, sports. Right, which those are certainly not yeah. extracurricular, but again, I think the school newspaper, internship opportunity, court. School, exactly. Yeah. What, you know, a lot, when, I think when we went to school, they were called clubs or a yeah, lot of times. debate like club, moot court, and, model UN. Right. Martin, you want um, to? Yeah, we, so the student survey actually does include um, questions about the types of activities that are offered at the school and the, um, and the types of activities that students would, would want to be offered at the school and whether they like the activities that they're, they're doing. Um, it's, um, it doesn't specifically differentiate between after school and during the school, but I think that's what you're- Right, you're and I think it suggested. wasn't factored, it wasn't factored into the, the progress school reports progress score. reports, that was- um, That may be, the, the, yeah, I mean, the results that right. you get from that are, you know, sometimes a little, the, the data can be a little bit odd, but-, um, you, but you mean unreliable? Uh, well, just, or just, you know, students saying they participate in something, but then not, saying what, how they feel about it or saying how they feel about something, but then not saying that they participate in it and it's, the matches are a little strange. But in it, that's, that's maybe a little too wonky for this. Um, this, uh, this, this is a really wonky <laughs> <laughs> um, But um, I, so going back to your original question about um, incentives, I, I think, uh, you know, I think the Inside Stats report um, will motivate different types of behaviors. Um, I think anytime you uh, put in, out in public uh, an evaluation, a measure of what a school's doing, um, it's, I mean, that's a form of accountability, publicizing information, and, um, and you're gonna see schools orienting um, towards uh, the things that are included in there. Um, w one thing that I think is uh, really important to keep in mind and, and, and consider is that uh, when, when the things that you're measuring are performance measures, absolute cutoffs for different types of outcomes, um, the motivation for school staff is very different than when you measure other things like uh, participation in different types of activities or progress in different measures of, of uh, student outcomes. The performance motivation, and Miriam should chime in here to tell me if this is uh, accurate, but if you have a cutoff like meeting a graduation requirement or 
achieving a particular score on the state ELA or math test, um, the, the focal students are the students who are on either edge of that cutoff. The students who are just short of meeting the goal or the students who are just above it and are in danger of slipping behind. And those are the students that get the attention from the school. And so there's, uh, there's certainly value in measuring how many students are meeting that bar, but there's a risk that you zero um, schools in on improving that number by focusing on those marginal students. And when you measure something like progress or whether you, when you measure uh, activities or, or experiences of all students, um, the, the focus shifts to all students and how can you advance their learning and how can you improve their experience. And that's really what, you know, what we've tried to do in, in the progress report. So, so let me interrupt. So sure. for example, at the um, high school sports careers in the Bronx, the principal gets graded based on how many kids get 65 on the regents. And they focus all of their energy on getting everybody to get exactly 65 on five regents exams. And they don't do more and they don't do less. And that's exactly what they. So I think, I think that, uh, so the, the regents measures on the progress report are, um, are weighted measures. So that students who are coming from further behind get weighted more. So, the, so yes, the, the goal is to get the student to the 65. The focus is on getting students all the way up there, no matter where they start. But that, that cutoff is, uh, has been an issue. And that's one of the things that we have been focusing on more recently. And the way we've um, tried to focus on that is not, so we have some measures that increase the score you need on the regions. Um, and, and that is because uh, a higher score matters in the real world. A kid who goes to CUNY and doesn't have a 75 on ELA or an 80 on math is gonna have to take remedial courses. So that matters, we measure that. But what we've tried to do is include more measures of higher level uh, course outcomes, higher level exam outcomes, so that it's not about pushing to get to a higher score on a lower level test. It's about pushing um, to get more students to experience the more rigorous, deeper, higher level, uh, advanced uh, coursework and learning that, that happens as they progress through high school. So a concrete example in our experience is if a student passes at a 65, yes, you can say the school can now rest, but we have a number of principals who understand that they, if their kids really have an aspiration to go to college, they need an 80 or 85 on the Regents exams. The flip of that is it's very hard to convince a parent sometimes to have their son or daughter sit for a Regents exam a second time after they passed. So I think it's, there's a complex communications question embedded, again, it goes back to your context question, about really enabling parents to understand what these scores mean in context. The other thing I really want to just keep hammering away at, and maybe it's just data that we've been obsessed with, there is this kids exist in a continuum of school for eight semesters. Any data point is a single point at time. And so trying to figure out how we can tease out and understand kids' progress over eight semesters is important. We've been doing work looking at, we, with the department, developed an on-track, near-track, off-track metric with simple traffic light um, signage so that parents had a sense of where the kids were and whether they were on-track, near-track, or off-track. What's been really interesting, and we're, we're going to release a report soon on this, is that the number of semesters a student is on track corresponds to whether or not they successfully complete their first year of college in the data that we have. So that it's, it's, a, it's a test score, yes, but it's an entire experience of skills building over time. And you, it's complicated, but we have to figure out a way to talk to parents about that. And, and one of the most important things that I've seen on yours is that the, the child's attendance is in really big font on the upper left corner of, of the report. Attendance project. is a giant predictor. Um, and so one, one suggestion I'd have for the, uh, for the department is to uh, include um, attendance, to make attendance more of a big deal on the, on the progress reports. But Miriam. I, I just wanted to um, perhaps put a perspective out there, which may not be, uh, maybe be the wrong one for this particular data meeting, is that in, it, it, the data instrument may be the wrong incentive. I, I don't, I'm not sure as a principal who's held accountable to these Whose, whose life depends on these, these instruments, these accountability instruments, that I'm incentivized by them, or that the consequences are the right 
that these are the right levers to really create systemic change. I think that there are tools um, that can measure, that, that, that are important. I don't think that they should be uh, um, eliminated, but I think that they, they should be put in their proper place. I don't think that however well-tuned these measurement instruments are, they can be incentives. I was having the conversation earlier with Martin that there are times where, um, in both in my previous school and my current school, I have to actually take a hit on the measurement instrument to do the right thing in terms of a curricular path for the students. And my, my belief is that, as Martin sort of uh, implied earlier, these instruments create a, a floor, but they don't raise a ceiling. And for students to really want to follow a path, that path has to be available for them. Right now, they understand the reality, which is to get into a top school, you have to be part of a certain socioeconomic class, I mean, or, or um, a, certain so, uh, a certain ethnic or socioeconomic class. I, I think that's a reality. I think students know that. I think parents know that. And I think a lot of the game is how do we get into those schools. But I don't think that the instruments can change that reality. I think that, um, I think motivation comes from leadership. I think motivation comes from working on the ceiling as, as intensely and as in a focused way as you work on the floor. And as you work on the middle bubble, getting the kids from twos to threes, getting the kids from threes to fours is just as important. And it should be just as important to focus. Because if the ceiling is a three and the kids know that, why are they going to work hard to get an 80 on the regions instead of a 65 if they know that the doors are closed to them at higher levels. So my, I would just question the idea of this instrument as, the, a, as an incentive to change a system. I think that there are other really important factors in the system that are much, that are silent and are much more powerful, um, it, that are much more powerful motivators and barriers that exist. I'm gonna open up the floor to questions. We have um, people walking around with mics and uh, I'm not gonna identify, you know, they're gonna, I'm not going to identify people they are. So raise your hand and one of them will give you a mic. Um, can, um, Miriam, can you give me an example of when you had to make a uh, curricular, you, you had to take a hit on um, accountability in order to do the right thing for your kids? So I'm coming into middle school for the first time from a high school perspective and um, so I have to, uh, we have an accelerated middle school, so we offer regents in eighth grade, which I don't think is always the right thing to do, by the way. Um, but one of the places that I think you can accelerate early to some good effect is in mathematics. Um, and so to offer the mathematics regents, we also have to offer the eighth grade state exam. We can't avoid that. Um, if you look, if you run the numbers for the, the middle school math exams, versus the higher level, the, the region's math exams, and then up to Algebra two, getting a, a level three or even a level four on a middle school state exam is not a predictor. It is not an accurate predictor that that child will be able to um, persist into higher level math. It is the wrong lever. It's the wrong target. But in order to get around that target and try to pick another target, um, I have to take a hit. I, it's very difficult to, to, to hit two targets in the same year. So you have to focus on one or the other. So if you focus on the algebra target, which is the right target to focus on for the students, you take a hit, your teachers take a hit, everybody takes a hit on the middle school target. So the question is, how do you set the right targets? And part of that is my decision as a principal to make sure that I'm focused on the right things. Um, and uh, so that's one example, I think. In, in high school, there's a little more freedom. There are alternate exams. You can, you can instead of the regents, you can, you can take the IB, or you can take an AP, or you can, take, uh, an S you can get a certain score on an SAT. In the middle school, there is no escape. And I think that it is, um, I, I think that it, it, pro pro it, ha it poses some significant barriers to teachers and principals. Do we have questions? Hello, yes, Laura. Hi, so I think everybody's made the point that it's very hard to capture in one document, particularly pre presented in an attractive, concise way, everything that everybody thinks would be useful. And I wondered what your 
intentions were for how this document or the next version would be used with others, for example, the school profiles you currently do on Inside School obviously tell that larger story that people have been talking about, about that qualitative feel and how it fits some of the things Martin was asking about, how it goes together in the bottom line and if you had to sum up the feel of this school. So is there a way to think about and similarly, if one wants more information about specific offerings, one could be referred to the high school directory or even the Department of Ed's list um, uh, of statistics. So, so is there a way to think about, how, you know, at least within inside schools, is this going to be side by side with the profile and whether there's a way, maybe even in this document, to refer people um, to other places without overwhelming them because otherwise your task is impossible. Um, and I guess I would just, the one to me thing that was missing in terms of context was on these student surveys that if you don't have response rates, it's hard to know if the school has 100 kids and 63% of the students say they feel safe, did only 10 of them answer? So anyway, but that's, that's just a side. But so my question is how you would refer um, people to other sources and how you see this working with other insights. Yeah, well, what we're, um, what we're hoping to do is, I mean, we, we, we made the, the four-page PDF into a, a PowerPoint, which is a little bit closer to what you see on a website. Um, and then we, we plan to refine it further with your, um, you know, with all the comments that people have given us and put it instead of the at a glance on the Inside Schools website now. So it would be, um, it would be supplementing that. Now we have a link to the Department of Ed uh, statistics so that you could go deeper and you can go, some parents are obsessive and want to, um, you know, want to download Excel sheets and compare 25 schools. And some parents want just a snapshot, so this is a way to accommodate um, uh, both of those. I would ideally, I would like it to be dynamic because what um, both Miriam and Bob allude to is honestly some schools are on their way up and some schools are on their way down and I want my child in a school that's on its way up and not in one that's, so that if you can look at change over time, um, that's something I'd like. Um, and we also, we, we think this is very heavy, text heavy and number heavy, and we want to have information graphics that make it uh, uh, really easy to understand. And information graphics is a whole specialty of graphic design now. So that's what we're hoping, um, and that we're hoping to be able, that parents will be able to search. I'm very cognizant of Miriam's concern that like not everybody can go to the top 10 schools. Um, and. I'm, I'm really, um, you know, eager to have your suggestions, Miriam, and, and other people about how we can give a really fair portrait of, of those schools. Um, oh my, all right, somebody, yeah, all right, over there. I'm so glad, you know, I, went, I gave one talk where like nobody raised their hand, that was so awful, but yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm coming here from school books, so I appreciate the, uh, the challenges and all of this, and I'm wondering how you guys are thinking about translation services and making this available because so much of this information needs to get into the right hands. And parents, yes, but seventh and eighth graders, to your point, and guidance counselors, and for the parents and kids for whom English is in their first language, how are you tackling that? That's a really good question. We have on inside schools, we have the Google Translates, uh, which translates it into 50 languages. I understand the Swedish translation is really excellent. <laughs> Uh, the Romance languages are pretty good. The uh, East Asian are not so good, which is a problem because Chinese is one of our top languages. So, um, in term, we're trying to have more pictures, fewer words, uh, to handle not just uh, people who don't speak English, but people who have low levels of literacy. Um, so that's why the slideshows we think are really important. They really show you what's inside schools. And I'm hoping that there's some miracle worker who uh, can do infographics that information graphics that will make all of the um, deep data that Martin has been collecting will make that easy and uh, visible to people who have uh, low levels of literacy and also low levels of numeracy. Hi. Um, I'm Matt Lean. I'm a former teacher. I had um, two points kind of related. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, my name is Matt Molina. I'm a former teacher. I had uh, two questions kind of related. Uh, the first is, um, is the 
data department knew, because my understanding is that Obama's um, follow-up to No Child Left Behind, which is called Race to the Top, requires data to be collected in order to qualify for the grants? Um, no, uh, the department's not new. We've had uh, an accountability office for 10 years at least since um, the original No Child Left Behind and I, I think before that as well. The progress reports have been around since um, 2007 uh, and, we, and we did a pilot the year before, so really 2006. Okay, and so along with that, so oftentimes policy can be related to the dollars behind it. So I wonder, does DOE have on its website um, vendor contracts by, by dollar amount? Um, so the, so there are, the, I'm not a budget person, so, that, so I'm not uh, too familiar with it, but the, we do have um, school allocation memos which uh, talk about the budget that each school has, and I believe the city comptroller's office has um, lists of all of the vendor uh, contracts that are in place. Who's got the mic? I do. I'm Diana Seneschal and I teach at Columbia Secondary School. Uh, thanks for this wonderful panel. Very interesting. I was wondering what... Especially uh, Miriam, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> what could be done to bring curriculum to the forefront of public discussion and awareness? When we're listening to the stories about high schools that have a specialty, have a theme, and maybe one course in that theme, or high schools that don't offer a full sequence in mathematics, and this disconnect between what the public thinks a high school offers and what public thinks a curriculum is, uh, or, or many different definitions of curriculum and the reality. What could be done to refine a definition of curriculum and to, uh, 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 to bring the question of curriculum front and center so that when parents look at schools, they're asking what's being taught here? Nobody wants to answer Sure, that. I'll jump in. I think that the curriculum stuff is really starting to come to the fore with Common Core, and I'm hopeful about that, but the conversation still is about Common Core modules and textbooks and not the continuum of courses, which worries me. I think that public documents, I think going back to something Miriam said that really stuck with me, that there, we have great leaders and teachers in our school system, and I think we need to rely on their professional judgment in some areas and, make, and work with them to make some assumptions reality in school. So I do think that there's a real need for much more congruence in curriculum. I don't think we need to be France. It's, you know, Wednesday the 23rd, we're teaching polynomial functions. But I do think we need much more coherence in the curriculum, particularly for our younger teachers. So I, I think that it would make sense to try to come up with a New York City curriculum built by our educators that we use in, in years one to three and then kind of loosen up as teachers become more experienced and schools become more developed. So, but I think those are policy questions and I think we're not gonna be able to solve it uh, with this kind of um, report. Yes. Hi, my name's Amy Schwartz and I had, an, I had an initiative on trying to reform physical education in the schools with the Women's City Club. I'm also a parent of a middle schooler. My question concerns this. Um, on the Inside Stats report, and this reflective of the progress reports from DOE, first of all, thank you for asking kids about their experience with physical education. Unfortunately, they don't ask if they are taking phys ed in the schools. And as we know, unfortunately, most schools, most middle, elementary school kids are not offered phys ed as required by state mandates. So our effort is trying to raise awareness of this problem. So to address how Inside Stats could address this, one is they could include on their, on their notice how many schools have phys ed and how many do not, how many classes are being offered. Then the second thing is concerning that, I think that we should just generally raise awareness of the link between physical education and improved academic success. Studies have shown that there is a clear link on this. So I think this is a great opportunity to do that. I was on the uh, school leadership team at my children's school, and um, we were trying to get more phys ed. We had it once a week. We wanted it two or three times a week. And the, the principal was really resistant because she was being graded on test scores, and she thought if we had too much phys ed, the math scores might go down. Sometimes it's big misunderstanding. I think principal needs to be educated as well. Yeah. Anybody on the panel want to touch that one? or? 
Well, I would just say, I think in, in thinking about all of these things, whether it's physical education or some of the other curricular issues, um, it would be great to try to, again, different audiences, but to try to put it in from the perspective of a student. So not just does the school offer gym, but how many times a week do you have gym in, the, the, in various grades? Right. So just to add one more thing, um, the, I'm not sure that the, the statistic that most elementary school students are not offered gym is, is accurate. The city comptroller recently did uh, an audit of elementary school phys ed, and the, there, there was some non-compliance, which is a problem, but it wasn't nearly at that level. Um, the, the whether students are taking phys ed is something that the department's very focused on and auditing now as well. So um, it's, you know, we recognize that it's an important issue and we're, we're working on it. Yeah. Uh, oh, here. Uh, I'm Charles Trube. I actually worked on computerized school profiles for the Board of Ed in the 1980s. And I really want to congratulate everybody on not only how far you've come, but I think the quality and sophistication of the discussion as opposed to very simple notions of accountability. But here's the question. Everything that's been presented here, almost everything, has been consumer focused. The idea is you're producing these statistics so that parents and children can use them to select what schools to go to. To what extent do you really feel that the audience of people who need to make these decisions is, is motivated, capable, able to actually access this information and use it? Or to what extent are you really serving a relatively small minority of informed, motivated parents and children who are trying to make good decisions? And what do you see the obstacle so are to getting the information out to the people who are the, really the intended audience for this kind of information? Okay, so I did a number of focus groups uh, regarding this project. And what I could tell you, you know, across class, age, race, that the directory is the most used tool, no matter whether they have internet in the home or access to um, private consultation. The directory is the number one tool that is utilized. And then what we found after that is that Inside Schools is very much the um, kind of trusted resource by, by parents, um, parents specifically, for, for looking at that. So I think if we could combine our conversation with those two um, metrics, we would be able to reach our target audience because they are looking, they are tapping in. I haven't met a parent who said, I've never researched a school. It's just, what is that research? Is it, is it word of mouth? Is it uh, our tradition? Is it uh, what the community has to say, hard copy directory or going online? But yes, they are definitely looking for the tools. Um, I mean, I would say just come. One of the most amazing experiences in New York City is the high school fair. And if, you've, if you have students you've been, if you haven't, spend two days in the Bronx um, at the high school fair. You quickly understand that there's a very motivated consumer class. I think the question becomes one of transaction costs. How do we actually ensure the right information gets to the right parent at the right time, given the diversity of interests, values, and needs? across the population of parents in the city. And that's a tough one. I mean, and, and I think underpinning that is too, to what, and we haven't talked about it and it's not an appropriate forum, but our system believes that parent choice should be the determinant factor in placing kids in schools. I think choice is an important component. I wonder sometimes if we're replicating market dysfunction in, in privileging parent choice above and beyond other considerations like concentration of need in schools. Really hard questions beyond the scope of today, but. It, it, we have to think about to what end is this information being used in a broader context of how we're placing kids and making the match between an effective school and the needs of that student. Yeah, I think that's a very important point. On, on our website, we do have videos that help parents navigate the process, and we have one at the, uh, which I shot at the high school fair in Brooklyn Tech, and it's totally a mob scene. It's really a zoo, and it gives you a really um, uh, clear idea of how difficult it is for parents to navigate the high school choice. And I um, agree with Bob that it's uh, whether choice is a good idea is an important question and perhaps beyond the scope of 
this conversation? It's a good idea. How we implement it is the open yeah. question. For me. Um, yes, uh, my yeah. name is Martin Krongold. I'm a member of the Citywide Council on High Schools. Um, my, my exposure to the Department of Education system is that it has significantly improved access for children who previously did not have access to college-ready curriculum, period. There are more children taking PSATs. There are more children uh, taking SATs. Uh, unfortunately, the, it's taken 10 years or so to get more kids exposed to general education that are in the special education program. So it's a long, long, long process. My question is, why don't we get rid of regents to the extent possible to incentivize more children so they can be exposed to the importance of getting an 80 or an 85. The reason is, is that regents, whether it be regents for high school or, or tests for three to eight, it's overwhelmingly a basic knowledge test. And we have all these stats on basic knowledge. If we got rid of regents for any kid that got an 85, because that's what they would need not to take a regents anymore, they could take general exams that would be college preparatory and every kid, including those kids who in the past only thought a 65 was what they needed to get by, knew if they got an 85, they'd now be ready for college. Any opinion regarding what can we do to minimize taking regents for kids in high school? Okay, I'll, I'll give it a shot, but I don't know. Um, I, I, I think it goes back to, um, to, to one of Diana, Diana's questions actually about curriculum. I think that if we are one of the most tested countries in the world, and I think that one of the reasons that we do that is because we don't have any other definition of what kids are supposed to do in school. I think we could get rid of regents if we had a different definition of what students were supposed to do in school. We didn't have to test every year to make sure the schools were doing the right things because there was a common understanding of the kinds of books that kids were supposed to read, the kinds of math that kids were supposed to do. How about the grade they got in their class? Well, if, if we had consistent classes, that would be a great indicator. But in fact, the grades in, in different schools and different classes mean different things. So that's one of the problems. And I think that as long as we avoid defining a knowledge path or a content path or a curricular path, we're going to be stuck with assessments as our main well, portfolios would be great too. I'm going to get so, let Martin. Yeah. So <laughs> I think no. I think I mean I think um, so. The so the short answer to your question, Martin, is that it's a it's a it's a state graduation requirement, not a city graduation requirement. So so we can, we can't eliminate it uh, without the state eliminating um, the regions. Um, but I think I mean I think it's also you know I think the regions do serve some purpose. So they're end they're end of course exams. They're not. Um, they're not uh, standardized aptitude tests. They're meant to test whether students have learned the knowledge in the course. I think um, they do tend to be more focused on basic skills and they tend to be more focused on a broad range of subjects than on really deep knowledge about particular aspects of, um, of the, the subject matter that they're testing. And that's something that um, the state is, is, is working on as they begin to align the regents with the common core. Um, that, that said, I think you know there is um, there's sympathy in the department for um, Miriam's perspective that uh, we want to focus on other things and not just the tests and um, the um, the work that the city has been doing to get ready for the Common Core reflects that um, every student in the in the city this past year um, engaged in a unit of study in ELA and in English and in math um, aligned to the Common Core and did a performance-based assessment at the end of that. Um, and this coming school year, that process is gonna be expanding to more units and, and sort of deeper uh, integration into the <coughs> curriculum. And I think that really is an important path forward. Um, just incidentally, there are some schools in the city that, are, uh, that have a waiver from New York State <laughs> Um, to offer portfolio-based assessments in every, su every required subject other than English um, to their students. And they're doing some really interesting and, and powerful work with um, those kinds of portfolio-based, um, performance-based assessments. Um, but it's hard. It's really hard to do that well. And there is, there's a risk that um, in 
freeing up uh, schools to have the ability to do those kinds of uh, those, those kinds of assessments, you know, there's a risk that it slips below the basic skills level that the, the regions have, and so the support has to be the supports have to be in place to ensure that our teachers know how to teach in a way that aligns to those kinds of assessments, that they know how to create those kinds of assessments and use them effectively in a way that's uh, connected to what they're teaching. Um, and that's our big task um, over the next few years um, because pretty soon, uh, you know, a lot of assessment in New York City and New York State and the rest of the country is gonna look more like that than like the current regions. The other thing I would just say quickly is, uh, um, I get to do one thing that's really fun. The Supreme Court upheld healthcare today. Um, six three Roberts joined the left wing of the court, which is important. Wow. <laughs> wow. That was really fun. Um, uh, it, it's important you, be because it underscores <laughs> it underscores one of the challenges of the regions. Um, which is we, one of the biggest barriers to kids graduating, ironically, is American history and global studies. It is a giant barrier. And so I think there's an interesting interplay, not in the abolishment of the regions, but really starting to talk about what do we want kids to master and know, and maybe to go deeper rather than broader. Because I think one of the things that does inhibit schools from developing themes, for example, and a variety of other things is how much we've defined the core against the regents' exams. So does every student need to take American and global studies in the way that, as a content course? I think that's an, an open and interesting debate we should have. Similarly, what is the global studies and American course about? Is it about content, or is it actually about processing nonfiction literacy? My hunch is to pass it, the second is more important than the first, though most teachers don't believe that to be true. So they start, you know, with the it, with big history, they start with the formulation of the earth, and then they get to probably the end of the Middle Ages by June. Uh, and, and there's a whole lot of stuff that isn't on the test because they're trying to cover so much and do so much. So I think there's an open question in my mind about what do we really want to test because we really think it's essential and where do we want variation and, and give schools permission to innovate uh, in learning. Over there. Hi, Mike Campanelli. I'm a college and career coach with GED+. Um, my question is, how do we use this data and this information to hold accountability, improve schools, and also take the school's principals, teachers, off the chopping block, take them out of the public eye, um, and take that pressure off so that they can really just do the work that needs to be done? Um, so, I mean, I guess I, I guess I would say that most the, the vast majority of teachers and principals aren't on the chopping block as a result of, the, of accountability. And the, and the, what, the, what the accountability tools that the department has uh, are intended to do is, 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 not, is not just to identify uh, schools that are struggling and close them, it's to identify schools that are doing really well with the students that they have um, it's to identify the areas in which schools that are, um, that are struggling are struggling so we can have some other kind of intervention or support to help them improve. Um, and even for the schools that are really struggling, it's not always just about closing them. It's about finding the right kind of um, intervention to help improve outcomes. Um, but at the same time, I, you know, I recognize the pressure that principals and teachers are under. Um, you know, a lot of it's because of the accountability system, sure, but there are other reasons that t t principals and teachers um, are pressured. It's, uh, those are two of the hardest jobs um, that there are. And, um, and I think what we have uh, tried to do is, um, is uh, while maintaining uh, accountability, um, try to reduce the administrative burden of that accountability as much as we can and try to reduce other uh, uh, burdens that we're placing on schools that distract from the core work of instruction. Um, we're, not, we're not there yet. That's, I mean, this is gonna be sort of a, th a theme, I guess, of, of, of my comments today. We're, we're, we're working on it, but we're not there yet. But I think, um, but I think giving the space to focus on what really matters, um, while at the same time uh, continuing to develop new and better measures of how well uh, our, our, 
our schools are succeeding given that space um, is, is the task ahead of us. Over there. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, yes. Um, my name is Gail Greenbaum. Uh, I'm president of Whole School Healthy Habits. Just want to give a minute of background. I taught for 21 years in the New York City public schools. I taught English. Um, 20 of the years were at Stuyvesant High School. Um, and I spent my last year in a low performing school. And my observations, I think, might be of interest. Um, the biggest difference between the Stuyvesant students and the much lower performing school, which had a 65% pass rate, was the kids' attitudes and their habits. And um, my class had a 95% pass rate within six months of my coming there. So um, <clears throat> I would say a third of my students in this lower performing school were smart enough for sure to be Stuyvesant students. They never would have made it, most of them, because they didn't have the attitude. They didn't have the work ethic. Um, they didn't know how to put their best into it. Uh, one of my students, actually, I only taught there for one year. She's now in her third, she was a 70 student. She's now in her third year of college, $30,000 scholarship, A student. She was a, starting as a 70 student because she turned around her habits and attitudes. I think this is a huge factor in student performance. I've been in over a dozen New York City schools, CED schools, um, and universally, it's the kids' behavior. Um, you know, the teachers are not in control, the students are not in control of the behavior, and so the kids don't learn. I mean, there isn't a lot of I'm instruction. Gonna, I'm gonna cut you off there because we wanna get a couple of questions in, so well, anybody quickly wanna question, answer that? My question was, I mean, I think the teacher um, is there more way to measure the teacher's impact on students? I think it's a very valuable thing. And the principal's ability to get the best out of the teachers so that the teachers really have an impact. Because I, I, every school has wonderful teachers, and I've seen Anybody that. want to respond to that? Here I think I you've done a great job including trust in the metric. I think that's really important and undervalued, and it's great to see it in it. Um, yes. Hi. Um, good morning. My name is Sika Bidiaco. I actually work with a breakthrough program here in New York City. And part of my responsibility is helping students figure out what, when they're in middle school, what high school they're going to apply to. And one of the challenges I run into is that I give them a lot of the information that you were talking about here today. They go back to their middle schools and their guidance counselors come up with a list and say, your scores match this, your state scores match this, these are the schools you should apply to. So is there any um, plans to put resources towards helping middle school guidance counselors or having people in middle school that will specifically work with students, because you mentioned that those are the ones who tend to lead the high school process, to give them this information so we're not relying on them to find it on the internet some way or, or use some other resources, but there's someone in the school who's spending the six or eight hours with them a day to give them the access to this information that they need. Uh, Jackie, you, you wanna talk about how you work with guidance counselors in the Bronx? Uh, yes, uh, one of the things that we do uh, is we, we're looking for creative ways. We, we've been doing workshops and we will come out to you, but we're trying to also uh, take that and, and use uh, the internet and um, you know, various other means of, of doing the workshops as well. However, I'm going to be working with middle schoolers in the student, student success centers um, next year where I will go in and actually train them on how to use the Inside Schools website and this tool so that they can then have that conversation in their school and peer-to-peer -peer, uh, work with each other and we're gonna start tracking that system. So there's definitely a way to communicate with us and uh, figure out how we can get it down, done on a grassroots level. Give us a call and we'll try to help. Uh, yes. Yes, Mary Beth Holman. Before I ask my question, I just wanted to uh, second what Teresa was saying in terms of adding the after school activities to the measurement systems. In a short period of time, um, working as a grant manager for after school programs for the 21st century programs of the DOE, I saw children's performance transformed by the after school programs in which they participated. So, and I saw the really low performing students excel in after school programs. My question is that Robert referred to a rubric for student performance that has been developed in Chicago. And I'm wondering 
whether there's any research being done about the countries that have the highest levels of preparedness for their students going into college and what, how it is that they're succeeding. Because I think we t can be really insular in New York City and there's so many other opportunities for information. I mean, I think there's a ton, uh, and I think some of it's good and some of it's open to debate, but I think increasingly in, in New York and other places, we're looking at countries, some of which feel similar to us, some of which feel different to us, ranging from Finland to Singapore, with very different social structures, et cetera. So the complexity of actually making a New York City report card looking at the diversity of 1,500 schools is magnified when you then start to look at different cultures, traditions, histories, and systems. So, I mean, I think the one thing that I would say is that we have to figure out, it builds on the earlier comment about teachers, we have to figure out how to reward teachers much more effectively and, and give rewards being either monetary or esteem while holding them accountable. I'm not adverse to anxiety in the life of anybody who's got a consequential job, but I do think we're, we can't beat up on teachers and we need to figure out how to actually compensate them appropriately. I'm afraid we just have time for one more question. Yes, uh, my name is Carlos Guzman. I have a son in high school in Brooklyn Tech. Uh, he goes to sleep every day around 12.30 or 1 o'clock, depending on what day the homework they are. So my question is, why they don't allow those high school to go on Wednesday around 10 o'clock, and that way they leave then some kind of relief on the body, because they, they, they do very hard to, to get the homework. The other question is, why they don't do the, the regions, especially for physics, because he just took a physics in two times, like in, in January or in June, because of the, the, the formulas from the beginning until the end, there are so many different formulas that I don't think they can remember all those formulas because there's different issues. It's not like a math that you're gonna add it or subtract it. It's different issues, so that's my question. Miriam. Well, it actually might be a good idea to add some kind of average homework That's what hours saying. tonight to the, because I think that is a fairly common concern of parents, and I'm not sure that, in, number one, I would say that there is some independent work that's connected to advancing mm -hmm. studies, and you'll find that in college as well. I think the term all-nighter was created for freshman year at college. <laughs> so. So I, so I, 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 I sympathize with the with the homework load, but I think that there is, that that is an effect of a rigorous school. But I do think that parents are interested in how much homework is assigned. So I think that would be a good thing. Um, uh, I said no more, right? Sorry. Okay. Uh, just, sorry. Just quickly yeah. on the question about breaking up the regions, I, I think that's a really interesting idea. I don't know of any plans to do that, but for the uh, tests for the students in grades three through eight, um, the, the park consortium assessments that Bob mentioned earlier are structured in a way that there, there are these performance-based um, assessments that happen periodically throughout the year and then a final exam at the end of the year. And I, and I think it kind of follows the model that you're describing where um, the, the focus is on testing something that was just learned deeply and well rather than testing the full range of everything that's happened during the course of the year. So there's, there's some movement in that direction. So we're gonna have to wrap it up there. I, I wanna thank the panel. You guys are really terrific. Thanks very much. <laughs>